Miami, and I don't know if any of you have been in Miami recently. They say the nicest thing about living in Miami is that it's so close to the United States. So, <laughs> and uh, now that we lost LeBron, we're very sad, but we had a good four years. Uh, I've been asked to talk about um, treating actinokeratoses with topically applied amino levulinic acid, photodynamic therapy. These are my disclosures, and I will be discussing off FDA labeled indications. So what is photodynamic therapy? Uh, you apply uh, an exogenous chemical, ALA, aminolevulinic amino acid. Uh, it supposedly, selectively is taken up by mitotic cells, malignant cells, and then through a series of enzymatic conversions, it is converted to protoporphyrin-9, and then you expose the patient to light, the protoporphyrin-9 then kills the cell. Let's go into a little more detail. If we look to the left, the red circle is the exogenous 5-ALA, which is applied to the skin. It selectively gets picked up by the cancer cell, and then through a series of, bi of enzymatic activities, the ALA is transformed and is transmuted and transported into the, from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria and then makes the protoporphyrin 9. Well, who cares? Now you got protoporphyrin 9 in your mitochondria. Well, when you expose protoporphyrin 9 to intense light, and we'll be focusing, no pun intended, uh, primarily on blue light, uh, the 435, 432 in that range, uh, the protoporphyrin interacts with oxygen, and that's an important factor, and we'll get back to that later, uh, and induces the production of singlet oxygens. Uh, the good news is that these singlet oxygens have a lot of energy, and they go spinning around in the cell, poking holes in the mitochondrial membrane, but they have a very short half-life, so they really don't have enough time to get out of the cell and kill the neighboring cell which may be a normal cell. So presumably it's a selective death of the cancer cell that originally absorbed and incorporated that exogenous ALA. Um, what else happens when you use PDT besides the singlet oxygens? There is an inflammatory response. Initially polymorphonuclear leukocytes infiltrate the area that you've just exposed to the light uh, it comes on within four hours and then by two days starts fading out. But in addition, <clears throat> macrophages and lymphocytes increase in the area and very interestingly, mast cells also accumulate and stay there for about three days. And why is it interesting about mast cells? Well, it turns out that the response to PDT locally is primarily erythema and edema. And it turns out that the edema can be blocked by antihistamines because it is generated by the degranulation of those mast cells that have been brought in because of the PDT. So you can get rid of the edema relatively easily with these antihistamines. Unfortunately, the erythema is not due to the mast cell or the histamine, and therefore the erythema will persist. Now, there are other things you can do. Maybe we can consider using something like Merveso if you really want to block the erythema, but now we're going way off FDA labeling. <laughs> okay. So how do we prepare uh, the ALA to put on the skin? The ALA comes in a applicator. Within this cardboard applicator, there are two thin glass vials that the contents have to mix. So there are two red dots one over there, another there, and you press on those dots and you break the vial inside, and then you go down the length of the tube to make sure it's really crushed up well, and then you shake it up. And now you've mixed the ALA and it's ready to apply. Uh, keep it facing upwards because you don't want it to um, get occluded by all those broken shards of glass. So keep the applicator point up until you need to use it on the patient. Uh, there's also a plastic crusher that will crush it for you. Now, this is the way the FDA approved it, and we'll start off with that, and then we'll move on uh, to how everyone really uses PDT. Uh, you, you take the applicator, you apply it to individual targeted actinokeratoses, 
supposedly you let it dry, but it'll never dry because it has polyethylene glycol, which always will have a glistening component to it. So don't wait forever. Wait a, two minutes. And then you apply it a second time. Then you protect the patient from light for um, at least 18 hours. Usually it's overnight. And then you bring the patient back to your office according to the FDA. And then that's when you expose them to the light in order to activate the protoporphyrin that's been developing over those 18 hours in the dark. So then you get the treatment with this blue light machine, uh, two to four inches away from the skin. It's 16 minutes and 40 seconds. Why did they get 16 minutes and 40 seconds? It's a thousand seconds, <laughs> so that's the reason why. Uh, protect yourself, protect the patient from the light. This is not ultraviolet light, it's visible light, but it's quite intense. So how good is it? Um, if you look at the uh, percent of patients that are clear at least 75% of their actinic keratosis, that's an FDA endpoint. 75% or greater reduction in the number of AKs. What percent of patients have that? Uh, the number's a little smaller. Can, can you see the number up there? Can you read the number there? I can read it. I'm going to try to read it. Okay. Yeah, it's 77% uh, of the patients will have that uh, endpoint of at least a 75% reduction. And that's just after um, one treatment. Now, how about 100% clearance? That's a really nice endpoint, right? The FDA loves drugs that treat a disease and then you don't have the disease anymore. So that would be the 100%. And then that is about 66% of the patients. All right? Uh, if you give them a second course, these numbers bump up by about another 5%. If you give them another second course of the PDT. Okay? Now, the FDA studies allowed for grade one and grade two. These are not Clay's type of histologic grades. <laughs> These are clinical grades. Grade one is, you know there's an AK there, but you could just barely feel it. And grade two, it's nominally hyperkeratotic. You could just feel it. Uh, and the question was, does PDT treat both of these types? Or are you just taking the low-hanging fruit and treating the really easy ones? And the answer is, no, you're treating both grade one and grade two about equally and the numbers are up there, about 90% of both of them get uh, destroyed by the PDT. Okay, now, what happens a year later? You've given the patient the PDT, 83% of the lesions are gone at three months. What happens over the succeeding nine months? Well, it drops down to about 64%. So, Yes, there is a recurrence of those lesions, but it's relatively small over a whole year. And again, you may want to give PDT more than once. The good news is safety. There was no scarring in any of the clinical studies. The most common side effect was local skin reactions, specifically that erythema and edema, which we talked about. And stinging and burning, and we'll talk about that. Uh, when does that occur? It occurs primarily when you're giving the light treatment. The good news is that it peaks at about six minutes. So if you can talk the patients into sticking out and staying in the light uh, exposure, then after six minutes, the pain starts decreasing. Also, you can use a little fan, and that helps cool the patient down. As you'll see in a few moments, you don't want to cool the skin too much, and I'll show you that in a moment. It's relatively limited downtime. They're usually within four weeks, whatever erythema and edema developed, definitely in four weeks it's gone. Uh, do the patients like it? Yeah, 94% of the patients like the cosmetic results. And the physicians said that 92% of the lesions were cosmetically good or excellent. So on a cosmetic level, PDT is helpful as well. So, 
How can we make PDT better? That was all the FDA way to do it. Well, one may be shorter than 18 hours, and also it would be nice to use it as a field therapy, broad area, rather than for targeted lesions. Are there any data that you can do that? Well, here's a study that um, treated patients either for one hour, two hours, or three hours with the ALA, and then gave them the light. And they also treated the whole face, rather than just targeted lesions. What percent of the AKs on the face decreased and went away? Over 90% of them, and it didn't matter if it was only one hour treatment, two hour treatment, three hour treatment. So you've just knocked down the treatment time by 17 hours and overnight. You can do it in one hour. Again, off FDA labeling. Here's even a more uh, complex study. There were five groups. One group got uh, broad application on the face and then only one hour of incubation Another one, broad application, two hours. Another one, broad application in three hours. And then spot therapy, targeted therapy for two hours. <clears throat> and the fifth group actually had a vehicle. As you can see, compared to vehicle, all the treatments with ALA had a percent reduction in the number of AKs way above the vehicle. Uh, but even with one hour, it worked, maybe slightly less than if you do two hours or three hours, but if you give a second dose, then they're all up at 70 and over 70% of the lesions are gone, even with one hour. And then if you look uh, at week 24, the final result, about 70% of the lesions are gone. What else can you do to make it better? Well, maybe you could occlude the ALA so it gets absorbed better, especially on the arms and legs, which are not FDA approved at the moment. And this was a study where they treated actinic keratosis of the upper extremities and then gave them PDT, but how they did the PDT was three hours of occlusion on the arms of one extremity and no occlusion, just three hours of incubation on the other arm to see if the occlusion brought anything to the table. And as you can see in the blue bars are higher than the uh, orange bars. The blue bars are the extremities that got the occlusion for three hours and the orange bars are the ones that just got the um, ALA for three hours. And you're getting a 25% uh, benefit by a greater reduction in the number of AKs if you use the occlusion on the arms. So that's another way you can make PDT better. How else can you make it better? Well, maybe you can increase the temperature of the skin while you're incubating uh, the ALA. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, it turns out that the level of the protoporphyrin that is ultimately made increases proportionally to the temperature of the skin. And why is that? Well, remember, these are enzymatic activities, so if the skin is cool, 30 degrees, they're going to be working less efficiently than if you bring the temperature up a bit. Not too high, you don't want to denature the proteins, but you just want to warm up the skin a little, so you make more protoporphyrin. Why do you want more protoporphyrin? You make more singlet oxygens, you kill more cells. And in fact, in a mouse model, you could achieve the level of protoporphyrin in the skin that normally takes an hour, you can, at 30 degrees, you could achieve that same level in 20 minutes if you just bump the temperature up from 30 degrees up to 37 degrees. So that's in theory. Does it really help clinically if you bump up the temperature? Now maybe when you occlude, you're also making the skin a little warmer, so the occlusion probably has a double impact. And this was a relatively small study of 20 subjects, and one extremity was randomized to be heated for a one-hour incubation. And the other extremity just got the ALA but didn't get heated but one hour. Okay? And can you really heat up the skin? The answer is yes. You can go from 29 degrees up to 38 degrees by heating the skin. So now you got warm skin. That's nice but it didn't make any difference. Well, if you look at the baseline, both legs pretty much look the same, but again, one of the extremities got heated just for that one hour of incubation, 
and the one on the left was heated. And you see many more subclinical AKs were picked up by the ALA because of the heating compared to the non-heating. So that's another thing you can consider doing to make it better. And there was about a 10 or 15% difference in the number of AKs responding at two months and at six months if you heated compared to not heating. Well, how about that pain? I told you I'd get back to the pain. Uh, could you cool down the skin a little to, during the incubation, not during the incubation, because if you cool down the skin in the incubation, you're working against yourself, right? You're making less protoporphyrin. But when you're making those singlet oxygens and they're poking holes and causing pain, maybe you can cool down the skin and it would be less painful. And indeed, when you use a fan, that's what we do, and it is helpful. But could you really cool down the skin using a zimmer, a um, truly cooling device, an ACD? Uh, the zimmer we use with lasers, and it really cools down the skin. That should be even better. You should get rid of the pain more, and probably it does, indeed. But there's a downside. When you cool the skin, what happens to the blood vessels? They're going to constrict. Well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? No, it's a bad thing because how does the protoporphyrin work? It has to interact with oxygen in order to make those singlet oxygens. Now, if you constrict all the blood vessels because you've gone out into the Arctic, um, you're not going to have enough oxygen. The protoporphyrin will get activated. It's going to have the energy, but it won't have the energy to, it'll have the energy, but nothing to donate it to. And it'll donate it to something else, but not to the oxygen, because there's no oxygen there, because you have not infarcted off the skin, but it's somewhat ischemic because you have cooled it down too much. That's all in theory. Is that really the case? Yeah, well, using this air cooling device, um, now this was with MAL-PDT, methylaminolevulinic acid, not ALA, there was a reduction in complete response of the AKs in the patients who got that really nice cooling. They had less pain, but it went from 82 down to 68% of the uh, um, complete clearance of the AKs. So you could do it, but it's not a good idea because it's not going to be as effective. There are a lot of light sources out there. Uh, the one that the FDA has approved is the blue light. Um, the reason there are a lot of light sources, it turns out that the protoporphyrin 9 has a very strong absorption spectra right in the blue light, but it also can uh, absorb the energy from other light sources at different wavelengths, like IPL and the post eye laser, and that's what that shows over here. The one on the left, that real nice peak, that's the blue, and that was the reason why blue was chosen and why this curved blue U device? Because the dose that is delivered to the skin when you're two to four inches away is constant on the chin, on the forehead, on the cheeks. It's always 10 joules per centimeter squared, where if you use some other devices, yeah, they're giving off enough light, but it may be uneven. So you may get too much light, or worse, you may get too little light, and therefore you would not be as effective with your PDT. And here's an, actually an example of a study where it was a very complicated study. I won't go into the details because they threw 5-FU to confuse the whole issue. But they looked at blue light versus PDL and versus P, uh, 5-FU. And uh, those are the details of the blue U light, 1,000 seconds, the PDL 595 nanometers, and 5-FU, and they looked at complete clearance and partial clearance, and it turned out that the patients that got the blue light, if we look at that very high endpoint, 100% clearance of all their AKs, 50% of the patients that got the ALA with the blue light achieved that high endpoint. 50% of the patients had 100% clearance of all their AKs. Only 8% if they got the post-dye laser. 
in this one little study. So yes, you can activate protoporphyrin-9 with the PDL, but you have to do it correctly, and in this case, it doesn't seem to be as effective. Okay, let's see what else we got. Oh, and finally, in the last two or three minutes, how about a, a quick comparison of the treatment of actinic keratosis with PDT versus inginal mebutate, picato. Picato is nice. Why? Because you can treat facial lesions in three days. Uh, PDT, you could do it in a thousand seconds. But uh, how do they compare? Well, we weren't going to look at efficacy because PDT is very effective, inginal mebutate, very effective, and you would have to have hundreds and maybe thousands of patients in order to detect a difference if both of them are in the 90% effective rate to show a difference between 90 and 93%, you need to have a lot of patients. And so we weren't trying to prove efficacy. That's already been proven and established, and the FDA approved both of these modalities. But we were more interested in looking at the local skin reactions that you get from PDT and compare them to inginal mebutate. And that, because there's a greater difference, you needed fewer patients to do the study. So we had 24 patients. One group got two courses of PDT. Um, one group got only one course of PDT, and then three weeks later followed up with, uh, two weeks later followed up with a course of inginal mebutate, 0.015% for three days, or a third group just got the inginal mebutate the way the FDA approves it without doing this sequential therapy. So let's look at efficacy. This is the percent reduction from the number of actinic keratosis from baseline. Two courses of PDT, 97% effective. We knew it was going to be high. ALA, one time, then followed with inginal mebutate, 87%, no statistical difference. Again, to see the difference, you would need hundreds of patients. And inginal mebutate by itself, also 90%. No statistical difference between them. All of them were highly statistically significant compared to baseline. I mean, a 96% reduction is quite impressive, but you couldn't tell the difference with respect to the efficacy. Now, how about the safety? Well, these are the local skin reactions of um, redness, scaling, swelling, vesiculation, pustulation, and erosion. And the inginal mebutate is in pink. The ALA PDT two times is in white, and the sequential PDT then, inginal mebutate, is in yellow. And you can see when you're using the inginal mebutate, um, you get a very brisk reaction in all of these um, parameters. The higher you go on this Y scale, on the Y axis, the more severe the erythema. Okay. And if you look at the peak summation of the local skin reactions, as I mentioned, there were six parameters. You could go from zero, you don't have it, to four, severe. So what's the worst score you can get? 24. Six parameters, all of them being severe, level four, four times six, 24. The best would be zero. But you have to remember, you're talking about actinic keratosis that has redness in it and some scaling, so it's almost impossible to get down to zero because your disease, or if you have any disease left, it's going to have some of those same parameters. Anyway, if you look at the local skin reactions after the two courses of PDT, that summation from zero to 24 was 4.6. If you just use the inginal mebutate, it was 12.6 out of 24, highly statistically significantly different. The ALA by itself had a much lower uh, reaction rate. And there was an intermediate reaction rate when you, in effect, pre-treated with the ALA, presumably got rid of a lot of the tumor load. <coughs> and then when you gave the inginal mebutate, it was slightly less 
brisk reaction because you probably had less disease to treat. Um, and it was statistically, not statistically significantly different than inginal mebutate by itself. But compared to two courses of PDT, the inginal mebutate seemed to have a significantly higher brisk reaction in the local skin reaction. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. So your whole area is precancerized, if you will. So you need something that kind of treats that whole area. And the same thing is true when we talk about radiation therapy for cancer treatment later on. Again, you're treating a, a region, an area with a, a type of a therapy. So you want to try to, try to treat the precancerous lesions, the ones that have got these abnormal genetic abnormalities so that you don't end up getting the fully developed cancers that develop over the course of time. So here you see that basically change again with so-called field cancerization phenomenon where you get these subclinical AKs and then the endolipus and solar keratosis and ultimately with squamous cell. And you can actually determine this if you use, uh, there's an antibody that you can use actually that can detect these little uh, so-called uh, hot spots, if you will, in the skin. This is not manifest as an actinic keratosis yet. So these are, these are genetic abnormalities in these cells. These cells have been, been transformed in a malignant fashion, and if they're not kept in check, eventually they'll end up with a squamous cell. So this guy's scalp, we see this all the time. It's just the whole area is, is, is damaged. So you can try to treat this with liquid nitrogen or something like that, but it's not going to be effective. You're basically always going to be playing catch-up. So that's why you want to use things like PDT, topical uh, therapies for this. Um, the P53 gene, again, this is mutated in a high percentage of both actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, P16 is another one that's mutated, and then there are these other changes. These are all molecular fingerprints of malignancy. And one of the reasons that's important is that if you look at people that are making decisions for us at CMS and other places, they like to, they, they're trying to say that, well, these really aren't cancers. This really isn't a cancer. It's not as important. It doesn't kill the patient very frequently and yada, yada. So they're trying to, to disallow reimbursement. And this came up back in the 90s, and it's going to come up again because there, there's a, it's a zero-sum game with the amount of money Medicare has to spend for these things. So they're going to try to figure out a way to not reimburse us for this as well. So we have to emphasize that this is a cancerous problem. And there is tumor uh, suppressor genes here that are mutated. Uh, this P53 is a very important uh, site of mutation. It's a sign of malignancy, not only for skin cancer, for other kinds of cancers. It leads to upregulation of these cells. It, it doesn't function normally. It's basically what you're doing is you're taking off the brakes. So in the wild type situation, if you get DNA damage, this is upregulated. It stops the cell cycle, and then the DNA has time to repair. If you don't have this P53 working normally, the cell replicates with these thymidine dimers and these abnormal uh, things that I've showed you before, the mutations accumulate and you get cancer. Now, what do you see under the microscope if you get a, a solar keratosis itself? Well, you see these various changes. Uh, again, the picture is worth a thousand words. So you see these focal areas of keratinocytic atypia with the overlying parakeratosis. This is all this blue spaghetti, which is sun damage, solar elastosis. Here you see keratinocytic atypia. And this is usually confined to the lower part of the epithelium here, but it actually sometimes can be full thickness in focal areas. So again, we don't use just full thickness atypia focally to make the diagnosis of squamous cell. You have to put it in the context of the rest of the lesion. And here's a classic example of one of those on this guy's ear, which is a common location. Now, there are a lot of subtypes that have been described in the literature. I'll just kind of briefly go through some of these. This is what's called a, a hyperplastic or hypertrophic solar keratosis, just a thicker lesion, analogous to what Brian showed is that uh, class two lesion. Here you just get more verrucous epithelial change associated with it. Again, you tend to spare the follicles, as you see here, uh, because you can get focal full thickness keratinocytic atypia, and you get some uh, budding of the these atypical keratinocytes that impinge on the papillary dermis, but don't break loose from the epidermis. They're not actually separate, discontiguous from the epidermis. And here you see that extensive solar alteration again. Sometimes we see pigmented solar keratoses. These look a lot like solar lentigines. Basically, they look like a solar keratosis, but they have pigment at the basal cell layer. Sometimes it's melanophages. Sometimes AKs can be atrophic, very, very thin. And again, you get a thin epidermis. You can have lichenoid AKs with dense uh, infiltrates of lymphocytes in them. 
You can get acantholytic solar keratoses, where the cells kind of uh, break apart here in the epithelium. Again, these are still benign lesions at this point. If you left them alone, they could turn into squamous cell carcinoma. And then we do see situations where you get true squamous cell carcinoma, where you get atypical keratinocytic proliferation over a broad front involving follicles associated with focal areas of actinic keratosis. So again, you, this is when you start involving things in a diffuse fashion. We'll call this a solar keratosis associated with or developing in an uh, squamous cell carcinoma developing in an actinic keratosis. They can sometimes be bowenoid, look pagetoid. Again, this is a focal change and sometimes can involve follicles focally. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, when you treat with PDT or one of the topical therapies that they recur is that you have sanctuary sites of these atypical cells in some of the follicles and they repopulate that over the course of time. And that's one of the dangers of treating melanoma, for example, with a miquimod. Same thing can happen there as well. A solar chylitis occurs on the lip. Okay, and this again is a, a field phenomenon. It looks pretty much just like a solar keratosis on other parts of the body. Arsenical keratosis. Again, we don't see this as much as, as we uh, used to in the old days, but there actually still is arsenic on the internet. Just like you can buy silver on the internet to take systemically, there actually are some arsenic compounds as well, believe it or not. And uh, these are usually people that were exposed in an industrial fashion, but occasionally people that drink well water, especially from Mexico, they can get arsenic exposure. Uh, they get these uh, verrucous keratotic papules often on the palms and soles, it can be associated with squamous cell carcinoma in situ of the, of the trunk as well. And these look pretty much just like actinic keratoses, and then they can evolve more uh, fully into full-blown uh, bones disease. And then puva keratoses. These are similar to solar keratoses. They don't have quite as much atypicality, but these are in people that have received sorolin and ultraviolet A. So squamous cell carcinoma, solar keratosis, this is really one disease on a continuum. So if you, if you take away the immune response of these people, this really just goes haywire. And the number one cause of death in people that have renal transplantation is squamous cell carcinoma that metastasizes. It's not the renal disease anymore. So this isn't transforming into a squamous cell. It's evolving into a squamous cell. And the actual single progression rate has been postulated to be anywhere from about 0.25% to up to 16%, depending on who you read. But if you leave these alone for 10 years, about 10% or more of people will end up with a squamous cell carcinoma. So even longer, uh, more than that in some studies. So again, even in, in, and actually in some cases, even basal cell carcinoma. It's hard to, it's virtually impossible to predict which actinic keratosis is going to progress to a squamous cell carcinoma, but virtually all uh, solar-induced squamous cell carcinomas have contiguous actinic keratosis associated with them. So that's very common. So again, you can see this uh, disease uh, continuum. The, the more of these you have, the greater your risk of getting a full-blown squamous cell carcinoma. So here, solar keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma site to fully developed squamous cell. And this is obviously what we're going to talk more about this later on, but this very deep, diffuse, uh, ugly squamous cell carcinoma has got a focus of AK right here to the side of it. And uh, again, things can start like this and end up like this. So this is not a benign process. It's serious, it's something that we must take care of when they need to be treated. Now, how do you distinguish an AK from a squamous cell under the microscope? Well, AKs generally tend to be focal. Uh, they don't have as much acanthosis. They have these buds of keratinocytes. They can impinge the papillodermis, but they're not discontiguous. Um, this usually gives you full thickness involvement over a broad front. Uh, this always involves the papillary and sometimes the reticular dermis, but the cytology can be identical. So this is, as you guys who are dermatopathologists in the audience, you struggle with this on a daily basis. These criteria are in your handout. So this is what we use when we distinguish between AKs and, and squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes it's not so easy, especially if you get a very superficial biopsy. So here you see the cytology of squamous cell, the cytology of, of AK. They look identical at high magnification. Again, I alluded to this before, a 65-fold increase in the progression of AK to squamous cell when you get an immune uh, compromise situation. Uh, again, so this is a very important uh, thing to remember. Now, we wrote about this a few years ago, especially when AK was under assault by the CMS uh, Medicare uh, at the time, and we wanted to say, well, this is really directly analogous to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. It's just that there's a different carcinogen. Uh, CIN is, is caused by HPV. Uh, this is caused by ultraviolet light. So we thought, well, if we could propose this and uh, Medicare understands that, maybe they would at least understand the way that AK and squamous cells progress in a similar fashion. And we actually uh, uh, 
drafted this little uh, diagram and published this a few years ago, and we actually use the, uh, the, analog the name of uh, keratinocytic intraepidermal neoplasia, or KIN, uh, as, a, as a mnemonic device. And there have been a few people that have picked this up and used it more for research, but the concept is really reasonable, that you get the genetic alterations, the atypicality, the early changes that can progress from low to intermediate to high grade, and then ultimately to squamous cell. We'll talk about regression a little bit before. And basically, if you just look at these, uh, you can, you, there are, we did publish a, uh, some pictures that showed the way we think these things could be diagnosed clinically as well as histologically. So an early lesion just kind of looks like uh, Brian said before, just kind of a slightly pink area of the skin that may be just slightly rough. It's not even clinically diagnostic as an actinic keratosis. As time goes on, they become more verrucous and crusted, and then ultimately they end up as full thickness uh, atypicality throughout, which would be analogous to squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So again, clinically, these are very, uh, very macular kinds of lesions on sun-damaged skin. Histologically, they show just a very sparse, uh, slight degree of keratinocytic atypia, mostly at the lower part of the epidermis. And if you did study uh, stain looking for those uh, thymidine dimer type changes, you would see that here, but you don't really have changes of a full developed actinic keratosis yet. Now, this is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 1. So this is from the, the cervix, and those of your pathologists recognize this. Notice it's in a mucosal surface. But it's got the atypicality, again, confined mostly just to the lower part of the epithelium here. So it's directly analogous to what we see in the skin. Same, same exact thing. If, and then we uh, took the, uh, we said grade 2A would be kind of just a regular garden variety AK. Grade 2B is more like a hyperplastic or hypertrophic actinic keratosis again. So this is a more thick verrucous type, but again showing the, the alternating ortho and parakeratosis, the absence of follicular involvement. Here's a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia again showing more of the epithelium involved in the CIN1. And then grade 3 analogous to squamous cell carcinoma in situ, full thickness atypia over a broad front and the same thing in CIN grade 3. So it's a directly analogous process. Their carcinogen isn't any better than ours. We have the sun. They have HPV. It should be reimbursed the same way. It shouldn't be discriminated against, if you will. And what happens when you reimburse for pap smears and you monitor patients and you follow them carefully? You eliminate a disease. And it's extremely rare to get cervical carcinoma in the United States. If you go to Africa, it's rampant. It still kills patients all the time. But you don't see it in the U.S. And this is squamous cell carcinoma of the skin from sun damaged area on follicular, it's an obvious uh, squamous cell. This is, we had to search through the archives of Parkland for about 10 years to find one case of deeply invasive cervical carcinoma because it's basically been wiped out in the United States and it's going to be more wiped out as people start actually getting the vaccine for this. But this is cervical carcinoma. It looks exactly the same as squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. It's got the same cytology and everything. Uh, so it just shows what you can do if you treat these aggressively. And if we treat actinic keratoses aggressively and wipe those out, we should be able to eliminate squamous cell carcinoma also. And one person dies every hour of squamous cell. So it's an important disease and it's very important when patients become immunocompromised. So, again, the diagnosis and treatment, the management, would basically be the same as we treat actinic keratosis if we were to change the name. Again, uh, regression of AKs, uh, this has been reported to, to happen, and I'm not sure that it really does happen very frequently. I think what a lot of times that what happens is you get inflammation that kind of waxes and wanes. Uh, perhaps in some cases it really does regress, but hypertrophic lesions do not regress. Those are there. They're going to progress and if they don't get treated, they're going to end up as a squamous cell carcinoma. So, again, it's, it's tough to really document when the number of counts of AKs and studies and regression, even if it were to happen, doesn't imply that it's benign. So, again, we can't use that as, as a, a information or ammunition to say that these really shouldn't be treated. So should we rename AKs? I don't know. Uh, it is a somewhat imprecise term. It's misleading. And, unfortunately, people in the government don't seem to understand that it's cancer. Um, again, with CIN, they do. Uh, so if, if gynecologists can do this. Uh, we're smarter than they are. <laughs> we ought to be able to come up with a name that, that works for us, too. So hopefully at some point we will. Um, again, this does give a, a, a true uh, assessment of what we're dealing with if we were to give it some kind of a name of a carcinomatous type of lesion. Uh, again, people have said, well, you're going to uh, create liability and overtreatment and overutilization. I think we would have to do an educational program if we were to rename this lesion, but it is something that we should, should think about for the future.